much. Uh, so we're going to move on. And again, uh, we have, uh, we're going to tee up the panelists in order uh, in your program. If that's so said, that said, um, our first presenter, uh, Walter Kempsey, does um, send his apologies. He is stuck in Chicago and he could not get here. <laughs> However, um, being uh, efficient, he did send us his presentation. And uh, we are fortunate um, at 6.15 a.m. I, uh, I uh, texted a colleague of mine, um, uh, Tom Wakeman from Stevens, uh, who is very knowledgeable about these issues, and he's agreed uh, to present uh, Walter's uh, presentation for him uh, this morning. And, and again, keep an eye out because I will give you a little, little one minute um, to move up and try to keep this moving along, okay? Thanks. Tom Wakeman, uh, a.k.a. Walter Kempsey's. Full disclosure, I'm not an economist. So what you're going to get is my uh, reading at times of Walter's script, uh, my comments, and uh, at times I will pull Walter's... Uh, notes together and use them. However, I've been looking at this stuff for about 40 years. If I can get the thing to advance. There we go. Walter started off by saying, I want to assure you that uh, his comments do not reflect on me or his firm, Jones Wang LaSalle. And they are his opinions. And as I said, uh, you'll get some of my editorial. What's he want to cover? Darn. What he, what he proposes to cover is things that you're not surprised by. That world uh, trade will continue to increase. Exports of goods from the U.S. have uh, uh, a good competitive position. And that significant inf infrastructure investments will be required in order to continue this process. Nothing that su should surprise you. Here's the background information. One of the things, there are three main drivers in my mind of what's going to cause constant change. One is population. In 1960, when I was uh, starting high school, there were 3 billion people in the world. 2011, there were 7 billion people. Now we're heading to 8 billion people. The UN has changed their belief from 9 billion by 2050 to 11 billion people by 2050. And as you increase the number of people, you change a lot of the dynamics of how we interact with one another. And show the same thing with rats. What does that mean with respect to distribution? Uh, the people who were, uh, had the largest numbers in uh, 2080, excuse me, in 1980, 36 years later, it was similar. Five years later after that, it has changed again. Nigeria is now on the list and is going to continue to move up. In terms of who was the wealthiest, in 1980 you can see that Spain and Mexico were on the list and now they're gone. India and Brazil were on the list. If you note, the first two is about 40, 40 trillion dollars. The next seven is about $26 trillion. So there is a disparity, a disparity between who has the money and who doesn't. One of the things going to happen is the number of young people that are on the other side of the planet are going to become the middle class. I, just, I define middle class as those people with discretionary income. And in general, we're seeing uh, the population of the world get older in the mature economies. Uh, it's, uh, the fastest growing countries are those with younger populations. Measured here is a proportion of the population over 55, because 55 is when many people retire. And uh, those, those uh, younger people tend to have demands for commercial goods. As they become wealthier, first they'll start off at low pay. But then the Fordian principle comes into play, which the Chinese implemented about five years ago, where they say, uh, Henry Ford said, I'm going to give my workers $5 an hour. And people said, why in the world are you going to do that? And he said, because nobody can afford to buy my cars unless they get that kind of salary. Chinese are doing the same thing. So they're creating their own middle class. And they were going to worry less about shipping across two oceans to the United States than they have been. So who's, who's doing the work? Uh, it's a combination of answers that we have to remember we live in a period of technological disruptions. Ten years ago, the iPhone was put on the commercial market. How many things has that disrupted for you? How many of you use Uber? 
or, or have looked for a place to stay. Not a hotel, but an Airbnb. How many people use it to monitor their heartbeats? How many people leave on the GPS? And their personal information is now becoming part of big data. Things that we don't think about are happening. And in this case, the Chinese are distributing their wealth in some respects down to other countries, and they're depending on other countries, to build the consumer goods that we all continue to consume. And why do we consume them? Because we can see somebody else has them. Television, internet, and other tools are now communicating in a way that rapidly we understand who's the haves and have-nots. We're seeing stronger trade growth because of free trade agreements, investments in infrastructure as more and larger vessels are shown uh, in the following slides, demographic trends, and technological advances. These four things, Walter believes, have changed uh, the rate of uh, trade growth and that it will continue. In fact, you see stronger trade growth because of the factors that mentioned before, but also because we're now able to apply economies of scale, which means that you can drop the unit price of individual moves in the transportation system. And as was said earlier, you not only get the ship, but you have to have the terminal and the trucking lines and the rail lines. And because the trucking lines now face uh, uh, a variety of congestion problems, we're now starting to see other changes in behavior. You'll notice that actually there are three different periods here for ships. And I was in this sector on much of this time. Uh, there was a change in about 1995 when I went to work for the Port Authority in New, York, New Jersey and we sent out a letter saying, how deep a water do you need? And nobody came back with needing any more water than they had, which was about 40 feet at that time. That summer I got a letter from Sealand, which doesn't exist anymore, saying we needed 42 at the berth this summer. Wait a moment. <laughs> That's not the way the navigation sector works, navigation engineering sector works. You'll see that that jumped up in about 2002 to 5,000 and then 10,000 in about 20, uh, 2002 to 2017. And then you heard recently that we're seeing 15,000 going to 20,000 from about 2013 on. What does that do when you have a burst of cargo that hits the dock, which is the same size as the ship you had five years before, 10 years before? It causes congestion. So we're moving away from trucks onto trains and having shorter and shorter train hauls. Okay, who's buying all this stuff? It's the middle class, people with discretionary income. And that percentage keeps in growing. Uh, OEDC suggests that by 2030, the global middle class will reach 5 billion people. So we'll have about 8 billion of that, 5 million will have similar kinds of salaries and disposable income. Uh, that came out in uh, um, A Commonwealth. There was a book, and I forgot the author's name, but he was an economist from Columbia, that said we're all going to have about the same wage except the people in Africa. Well, it turns out Africa's suddenly now come alive, selling resources, selling food, selling a lot of things, and growing very rapidly, and they're going to be catching up with the rest of us. So what does this cause? As you have people move into the towns, you'll see a growth in urban, uh, urbanization, and mainly along the coast. Everybody seems to love the ocean. Uh, I, I know some stats on that, but uh, I, don't, I don't have my fingertips. Uh, but when you have people all show up in the same place, you get congestion. And what's that do? As measured as shares of GDP, the public spends uh, the last three decades on fairly stable 2.4% investments into infrastructure. The, last, the first big hump there you see is the last of the spending was on the Eisenhower uh, in a national or federal highway system. Uh, this, the slow growth economy and the federal outlays under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act temporarily boosted the percentages in the 2009 to 2010 to 2.7. How much are the Chinese putting in? The Chinese started somewhere around 12, I guess maybe uh, 
15 years ago, they've now scaled back to about seven. The Indians have increased theirs to, uh, it had been 2.3, now they're up to about seven. And we sit at 2.4. And that's not sufficient. Not as we watch our population. If you looked at that earlier graph, our population when we were building the uh, interstate highway was about 2.58. Uh, now it's about 3.34, heading towards another five. I mean, you can't put those people on the highway. If you've been to California, you might think Jerry wherever Jerry is. <laughs> California has a problem. They have a lot of two-lane roads, <laughs> and, and they have a lot of people. And things are happening that we are not anticipating. One of my messages to you is plan for the unexpected. I have family that lives in Napa. We never expected fires to go all the way down through all those areas. Well, combination of factors did. And now we have a fire. So the big ships, whoops, back. The big ships uh, have caused the growth in urbanization combined with insufficient roadways. Freight movement has shifted to railroads nationally and from stores to e-commerce. Much of the increase in e-commerce is likely due to congestion, discouraging consumers from going to stores. The trade deficit is due to the widening gap. Now, part of the widening gap that you see, you see the tonnage is about the same. But the uh, uh, deficit there, uh, excuse me, the dollar amounts are, are, the gap's about the same, but then the uh, tonnage amounts have collapsed. And part of that is because we ship out a lot of raw materials, paper, scrap steel, et cetera, where others are shipping higher value stuff to us. This is an eye chart, eye wash chart. But close examination, if you could, shows that Containers or bulk vessels uh, that are U.S. exports tend to be raw materials of low value per ton. In some categories, we have three of growth, agricultural goods, high-end capital goods, and energy products, which uh, have gone up quite a bit because of fracking. Now, there's some externalities to consider. One is the distribution of water around the planet. And in the red areas, one being uh, India, Another being in northern China, and the third being right along the Sierra, uh, uh, right along the uh, desert in Africa. All are suffering from water, water loss. This is not, it's not surprising that China is very interested in the Tibet, uh, Himalayan plateau, as it is a source of three rivers that flow into most of Asia. One of the things about water that I didn't realize is it takes four tons of water to make a, a bushel of uh, Tomatoes. So if you buy the tomatoes, you don't need the water. So that's why a lot of sh food is shifting. And, whoops. Uh, this shows increasing impact of automation. Growth among automation is indicated by the growth of robotics orders in the U.S. since 2009, which is when data first started was collected. It's a myth that U.S. manufacturing employment decline is because of China. It's far more likely that it's due to automation and substitution of capital for labor. One of the areas that we've seen a vast increase in uh, U.S. productivity is oil and gas, uh, which is at a historic high. It's worth noting that a significant amount of natural gas and oil are being used to produce a range of petrochemicals. Shown in the value chain to the right, the U.S. exports of petrochemicals such as resins, nylons, plastics, has uh, overtaken China and is the largest exporter to uh, South America. So we're back to seeing that trade growth is going to grow, that the U.S. actually has some products that do very well and are competitive in the global marketplace, and that if we don't make investments into uh, transportation infrastructure, we're not going to be able to get stuff out. Uh, the, to me, this is the problem of, uh, if you've seen pictures similar to this one that show uh, where the roads are congested, if you look out 20 years, you'll see that there are lines. They call this the heart attack chart because this is arterial sclerosis of our supply chains. In the end, whoops, do I go on the right way? In the end, I want to show you what Walter looks like. That's Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Tom for stepping up. I, I see that um, Jim stepped up, so why don't we go to Dennis? Can you come up and we sure. can uh, tee up your presentation? I think we've heard a little bit about aquaculture already uh, and fisheries, so look forward to Dennis's perspective on uh, the future of fish and aquaculture. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, most of the general comments about fisheries and aquaculture have, have been made, so I'll and Tony asked me to focus specifically on the Mid-Atlantic and, and uh, specifically on the future, not New England or Beth. Um, so that's what I'll do. Let's see. There. there it is, okay. Uh, let's see, what I decided to do is um, take a look back 13 years, tw uh, 12 years, and two months, or whatever, and see what kind of trends, what we would have predicted then, see how, if they're continuing, and also look at what's happening uh, now to uh, change trends in the future. And what I found out is that there's a lot of things happening now that weren't happening 12 years ago and that, that the future is likely to be much more volatile in mid-Atlantic fisheries, both commercial and recreational. Uh, and here's an overview. What I'll do is give you an overview of the, the uh, forces of change, the sort of disruptions that I see out there, uh, look at some past trends that are continuing, and then just give one uh, uh, simple recommendation. Um, I think the, the volatility is driven like a lot of what you've heard already about is, is uh, uh, climate change driven ocean changes in the ocean, both warming and acidification and so on. And that's going to affect both the resources, you'll hear more about that later. Um, it's going to affect how uh, fishery managers need, try to respond to some of these changes and it's also going to uh, result in fishery science being a lot less reliable as a basis for setting quotas and fishing restrictions which is going to result in lots more uh, conflict over what's being done. But there's also other things that I've been hearing that are going to change. And uh, in the Mid-Atlantic, for instance, the uh, uh, fishery managers are going to need to rethink uh, uh, state allocations of quotas and rethink uh, a lot of other things. And they shift from uh, uh, species-based to ecosystem-based fisheries management, which is ongoing, needs to be done. It's important that it is done, but it's going to result in lots of uh, uh, uncertainty about how things are going to be managed in the future. I'll get into a, a little bit of that. Uh, as has also been mentioned, there's a lot of technological change that's going to affect fisheries and fisheries uh, 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 enforcement and monitoring and so on. Um, I, right now, the Mid-Atlantic, there's only about 8% observer coverage, uh, f humans on ships. Uh, I think that over the next 10 to 12 years, that's going to be a, a much li larger percentage of trips are going to have observers, and it's going to be mostly electronic observers. Um, I also think some of the changes, um, you know, fishing is sort of two-thirds information processing and one-third catching. And as the fish move further north and maybe offshore and are not where they used to be, uh, um, those uh, uh, fishing operations that have some integrated and good uh, uh, links where ocean data are going to have an advantage over the smaller, more traditional uh, vessels. And that's going to result in some consolidation in the, in the fleet. Uh, it's probably going to start happening soon. Um, I also think aquaculture is going to, as I already mentioned, is going to have a big effect. Uh, but, uh, to my knowledge, besides this one uh, tentative operation off, off Long Island, which is about eight miles out uh, in federal waters uh, that is being considered uh, a huge uh, aquaculture uh, company called Cook Aquaculture that uh, is a Canadian-owned company that uh, owns all of the uh, salmon aquaculture operations in Maine and elsewhere around the world. I think they have 3,000 employees. Has uh, acquired a firm in, in North Carolina, Virginia, um, a big uh, fishing seafood uh, operation. And uh, my understanding is working with the North Carolina government to try and promote offshore development. So there's a lot of speculation that, that in the mid-Atlantic, those two, the, the one offshore Long Island and the one in uh, North Carolina, are going to happen sometime soon. All right, so what I'm going to do is just list out the 10 uh, reasons I think things are going to be uh, more volatile. What are the sort of the drivers of, uh, of disruptions? 
uh, one of these climate-driven changes in ocean conditions, ch uh, changing the distribution, of, uh, abundance and distribution of fish, their catchability, when the squid come up, when they're susceptible to gear, and so on. Um, I think equally important, perhaps even more important, is how the regulators try to respond to that as the, um, uh, as the conditions change and they're not quite sure whether they're, these uh, changes in catch rates, let's say, are, change, are a result of changes in the abundance of fish, how much is out there, or their availability, are they really just moving north uh, and out, uh, or their catchability. Um, I think it's already started to happen that the f traditional fishery models don't give them as much reliability as they used to in terms of setting uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, um, restrictions. And I think that's going to be a problem is even as we shift from species-based ecosystem-based management. Um, and the changes in the Magnuson Act that are going to result in uh, the federal regulators being given a lot more flexibility in how they manage and a lot more re requirements to look at socioeconomic conditions. You know, all of these things are going to result in changes taking place in the next five or, or uh, so years. Um, as I mentioned, I think, uh, you know, you have the situation where there's a lot of state quota for certain species that are off, say, the southern part of the mid-Atlantic area, and the fish are being caught somewhere else. And uh, it's, uh, something's got to change. And so I think there's going to be some changes in the state allocation of quotas. There's probably already some changes in the... Uh, uh, some of the committees on the Mid-Atlantic Council, although I'm not directly involved in that at all, I hear that. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I think the changes in technology are going to allow a lot more monitoring of uh, fishing activity at the same time that they are going to allow uh, the bigger vessels to have an advantage. And uh, I know in New England the shift to ecosystem-based fisheries management on the, at least a, a lot of the commercial fishermen think that it's the, the environmental NGOs are, are having much too much influence on fisheries management and they view this shift to ecosystem-based management as sort of reflecting that. I think that's going to go on more and uh, happen more in the future. Uh, I put this up um, the, just to show that the, uh, this, the commercial and recreational fishery, this, the target species of those two fisheries in the mid-Atlantic area, um, there's not a lot of common, there's not a lot of overlap in the species, which is uh, maybe one reason why the mid-Atlantic has less uh, recreational commercial conflicts uh, than a lot of other regions. Uh, that's probably going to change as the, as the mix of, of uh, fish changes and everyone, the availability and susceptibility to gear changes. Um, uh, I also, those are direct spending numbers. Um, they're roughly 500 if you run those through some multipliers. I'm not going to get into the uh, Im impacts as Charlie already did that. Um, um, the, uh, I want to just let it go with that because I, uh, okay, um, Menhaden, that line there uh, shows a fairly steady, that's the overall catch. Uh, uh, in uh, millions of pounds in the mid-Atlantic area. Uh, it reflects a huge contribution of Menhaden. Uh, about 67% of the catch in the mid-Atlantic area is Menhaden, and it's been fairly steady over the, over the past uh, 20 years. Um, that masks some significant declines in the commercial catch of, of the, most of the important species. So what I show you on the, on the bottom here are the major commercial species in the mid-Atlantic fishery excluding uh, blue crab and oysters which are caught in the bay. So this is sort of the blue ocean uh, fisheries. And they have uh, virtually all declined. Uh, I think overall the decline uh, has been about 43%. Um, uh, uh, some species it's 50%, uh, some 60% lobster, which isn't on here. It's uh, I think 84% and some other species. Um, uh, I did send, well let me, let me show the recreational, which uh, has a similar trend. Uh, if, so if, the point of this is if you take Medenhaden out of the mid-Atlantic, you, you wind up with a, a pretty significant decline in fish st starting in around 2007. This is a recreational fishery. Um, the line there shows angler days and the uh, bar charts show uh, uh, the different kinds. Again, a huge decline in, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, line is actually, is actually the harvest in uh, thousands of fish. The uh, rest is showing the number of angler days and the various types. That is going through the floor. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons, and I talked when I sent these things out to friends of mine who were involved in the Mid Atlantic and said, hey, How do you explain these trends? Um, there could be declines in abundance, there could be declines in availability, that is, they move in north and out. 
Um, they could be less catchable, they're just not susceptible to gear. Fishermen are spending more time steaming to the fishing grounds and looking for fish because they're in new areas, so they have less real fishing time. Um, the, that may result in a lot of people just not fishing. There could be a reduction of fishing effort. There could be retargeting their effort. There could be an increase in unreported catches. I know in New England, the tighter the quotas get, the more the unreported catches uh, get, so it could be that um, the catches are not going down by as much as it seems. They're just not getting reported in the statistics. And then there's this sampling error, which um, uh, is a very interesting story in the recreational fishery. Um, the recreational fishery, let me just go back to show that decline. The uh, participation rates in, catch, uh, in the uh, recreational fishery are based on phone surveys. And NOAA has been conducting those using, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the system, but basically they use your uh, landlines and they test coastal economies. Uh, as time goes on and everyone becomes uh, 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 wireless, um, in, in fact, now I think it's over 50% of individuals, including anglers, don't have uh, landlines. And some people who have landlines, I know I, we have a triple play, we get a big deal. We, we, if, you get, if you keep your landline, you get cheaper uh, wireless. So I have a landline I've never used. Uh, my wife doesn't use it, but nobody uses it. So I think probably the shift to uh, selling is more than even you think. So anyway, what's happened is, uh, what they found out is that if you look in areas where they use other ways of mething, uh, uh, measuring the uh, uh, angler days, um, participation rates are, are two to six times higher than what you get when you do these phone surveys. And so in the mid-Atlantic, where they've been relying on these uh, uh, phone surveys, they're now shifting completely to, uh, not enough completely, but they're shifting to mail surveys. But uh, if you go back and look at that um, <clears throat> thing, that decline uh, could be a result of people shifting to, uh, to cell phones, and as a result, ruining the surveys. Um, <clears throat> the significance of that Um, take a look at this. Now, this is the sea bass. These are trends in commercial and recreational catches and quotas in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, the commercial catches in general are pretty much uh, uh, on target in the quota. They're up and up down a couple of percent. The recreational catches are, in, in 2016, were 84% above the allowable harvest. And then it was 63% and 75%. Okay, so two questions with this uh, survey problem. Two questions, if, if the catch rates could be, uh, say, two to three times what is being reported in the surveys, uh, how are those quotas set? I mean, we, we, you know, we, we're, how do those catch rates affect the level of the quota, number one? And if they're four times higher than what is being reported as 84% above the, the quota for the recreational fishery, if you multiply that by four, you're getting up, you're going from 84% to like six or 700% above the quota. So the, you know, that adds another element of uncertainty in terms of how things are going to be shifted here and, and at what point they're going to use the uh, um, uh, mail survey and what's happened in the past. Uh, I'm going to skip the impacts. Uh, you know, I've got some questions on a lot of the, uh, the multipliers for recreational and commercial fisheries that commercial um, uh, NOAA's started using seafood industry, which includes a lot of forward impacts related to imports, and it comes up with big, big numbers. Um, the recreational multipliers frequently include, you know, vacation homes and spending on boats that may have been uh, somewhat related to fishing or not. Um, but uh, so I'm going to stay out of the multiplier thing. And let me just uh, sort of begin the end by saying I think these 10 milestones are pretty much the same things I listed at the beginning. Uh, keep an eye on uh, how... Uh, uh, fish are being redistributed and some of the abundance uh, and recruitment uh, problems related to uh, ocean change. How the regulators are responding to it, either by uh, changing quotas or dealing with uncertainty. I think the fact that the, the fishery models are not as reliable as they used to be is going to add to a huge amount of un, uh, more uncertainty and also a lot of, I know it's already happened in New England where the, the uh, f you know, when, when, when fishermen stop trusting the science and the basis of the regulations, there's a lot of non-compliance. And I, I think I'm not going to Harp on, harp on non-compliance, but it, it, it is an issue that, uh, that uh, unreported uh, catches. I went to the, the uh, sentencing hearing for Carlos Rafael in New England the other, uh, two weeks ago. Um, um, there's some significant uh, 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 underreporting of catches. Um, and it's All right, my conclusion is, as I said earlier, 
uh, in the Mid-Atlantic, there's going to be lots of uh, uncertainty about uh, the abundance distribution, catchability of fish, and when one is changing, when the, one isn't, especially with catch statistics changing so much. Uh, the models are going to be less reliable, especially as they shift to ecosystem-based management. Uh, people are not going to know uh, how much they can trust it, and they're going to be making regulations that are affecting incomes. And, you know, as a, a commercial fishermen are financially stressed now, so when you start lowering a quota more based on what, what, I, what is uh, perceived to be, you know, scientific evidence that doesn't justify it, it's going to be di uh, difficult. And I think the institutions are also going to change. Um, and then one very general recommendation. Um, I really don't have a lot of specific recommendations because I think every fishery, the conditions are going to be different, and I don't, I don't deal in mid-Atlantic fisheries. But there's a thing that's been around for a long time in uh, medicine and, and business and so on called integrated risk management. Um, uh, as we shift to ecosystem-based management, let's take the Menhaden fishery. Um, the Menhaden is uh, managed as a species. They look at, you know, it's obviously can sustain, you know, 300,000 uh, 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 pounds, uh, yeah, no, 300 million uh, pounds a year pretty sustainably. Um, and that's what they've been doing. Um, but uh, Menhaden's a very important forage fish, not just for a lot of other important fish, but also for uh, whales and seabirds and so on. Um, the idea that managing it uh, based on a species base as opposed to its, uh, the value of Menhaden left in the, uh, in the ocean to be foraged for these fish, uh, you really need to shift from a species-based uh, management. Um, I think this goes a, a bit of a step further, and it's been, it's been used in business for a long time and in medicine and a lot of other areas, um, where you, you don't look at the uh, abundance of fish. You look at its role and what risk factors are affecting it or how it is affecting the risk factors, if it's a forage fish or some other species. And basically, the, the three steps are pretty simple. You manage the uh, risk that you can't control, which in fisheries, unfortunately, is just regulating fishing. Uh, you monitor the leading indicators of unmanageable risks. Um, and the third step, which is the most difficult, is you establish some rules for um, changing what you're doing if the uh, leading indicators of risk become unacceptable. Um, that's really hard to do. It's easy to do the first two. In fisheries, it's hard for number three because uh, the only real response is going to be to uh, limit the fishery. Um, but I uh, have seen, if you, if you Google it, you'll see it's applied in lots of different places. And it, 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 it moves the focus, say, in fisheries, it would move it from stock abundance and max sustainable yield to uh, how you should manage things based on the risks they, uh, that you see coming along the line. And I think I'll just end there. Thanks, Dennis. So we're going to go back to uh, Jim. If he'd come up now, that would be great. Uh, again, try to ask our, uh, there's a lot to say and we'll have a lot to discuss in the session, so try to keep your presentations on some of the highlights and really what you want the group to, to really think about and take an advisement when we move forward. So, Jim Bennett, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, again, my name is Jim Bennett. I'm the Program Manager for Renewable Energies at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today to provide some context, let you know what activities we're involved in and how it fits in with the uh, ocean economy. First off, first off, I've got to figure out how to, which button. There we go. First off, uh, who we are. The Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, we are housed in the U.S. Department of the Interior, federal agency. We are responsible for the uh, expeditious and orderly development of the energy resources of the outer continental shelf and marine minerals as well. We have uh, several regions uh, in Alaska with uh, starting up some oil and gas activities. Pacific has uh, um, the, uh, uh, the oil and gas that it was uh, developed back in, the, uh, back in the 60s. Gulf of Mexico, as you know, is the behemoth of oil and gas production offshore for the U.S. And the Atlantic, where we have a, uh, uh, what we feel is a very, very promising and we're very optimistic about our renewable energy program uh, there. We are an agency that straddles uh, the old ocean economy as well as the new ocean economy that Mark spoke about earlier. Uh, and I'm going to touch, I'm going to touch on uh, all three of our programs, which include oil and gas, renewable energy, and marine minerals. 
the details up there talk about a process for leasing these areas or getting the resources offshore into use. Uh, the, each process is a little bit different, but in essence, we identify the need for a particular resource. We do appropriate analysis uh, and identify uh, environmental impacts and we put the areas out there uh, for lease, typically to the private sector, both in oil and gas and in renewable. It's usually municipal for marine minerals uh, purposes. All of this is done in the context of, uh, of a variety of regulatory requirements, including the National uh, Environmental Policy Act, uh, and we've done uh, about a billion dollars worth of environmental studies for our offshore activities uh, since the 1970s. First off, oil and gas. We have over 3,000 active oil and gas leases. They are essentially in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they provide 18% of domestic oil and 4% of domestic natural gas in 2016. These are, they have significant environment, uh, economic benefits, uh, specific, um, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico where it is an integral part of the local economy over 300,000 jobs, revenues to the U.S. Treasury, and local tax revenue. Uh, in 2016, we took in $2.6 billion uh, for oil and gas, second only to the uh, IRS. Uh, and that actually is a figure that's uh, small compared to uh, years past with the, with the depression in oil and gas prices. Uh, it was up, to, up at about $6 billion just a couple of years ago. Um, Activities in the Mid-Atlantic, we have uh, applications for seven G&G &G permit applications to find out about oil and gas resources offshore. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name earlier, but he pointed out about how whether anything happens in the Mid-Atlantic or not, and it hasn't uh, in the past or at least not since the uh, early 80s, uh, knowing what's out there from a national, uh, uh, from national standpoint is a good idea. Uh, well, there's an estimate of over 2.4 billion barrels of undiscovered, technically recoverable oil uh, in, in the mid-Atlantic. Marine minerals, uh, the OCS sand is used in New Jersey, Virginia, and Maryland. Uh, uh, Sandy has been a, a huge driver for that program. Uh, uh, beach renourishment projects saved 1.3 billion in damages. Every dollar that's spent on the sand and gravel program, the marine minerals program, results in hundreds of dollars of uh, economic value to society as a result of uh, damage avoided. Um, there's a lot of demand for offshore sand. We are involved in long-term planning efforts. And there's, uh, of course, like every other aspect, there's technology developments that has uh, the possibility of much larger capacities and deeper water depths, all of which would have to be appropriately coordinated with potential conflicting uses and appropriate mitigation. Okay, renewable. Uh, we're, we're really, like I said, very optimistic about this. There's three things that are required to make a successful offshore renewable project. Uh, uh, project. And that's, uh, first off, you need the wind resource. Secondly, you need a, a, a good market, and thirdly, you need a good buildable environment. Uh, we have a very unique situation in the Mid-Atlantic, or in the Atlantic in general, in that we have all three of those conditions. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, a market which is second to none on a global basis uh, for, for uh, uh, demand for energy. Uh, we have a buildable environment in a long, shallow, sloping shelf so that the technology that we have now uh, bottom-founded uh, turbines can be built. And uh, aside from that, we have, like I said, we have the market, we have the buildable environment, and we have the wind resource. Uh, the wind resource in the, in, in the U.S. is basically on the uh, East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, we're very lucky on the East Coast in that, uh, unlike the Gulf of Mexico, which has a buildable environment, uh, they don't have the wind resource, even if they have the markets. In the Pacific, you certainly have the markets, but you don't have, and you have the wind resource, but you don't have the buildable environment for current technology. They would be dependent much more on floating technology, which is probably still a few years off. So we're very, all of this is combined uh, uh, on the East Coast 
to the current situation, which has developed since our regulations were put in place in 2009, in 13 commercial leases. And these leases extend from North Carolina to Massachusetts. Every state from Massachusetts to North Carolina now has at least one uh, commercial scale lease in federal waters. So we're very optimistic about that. We have a number of site assessment plans that we're reviewing right now, and we anticipate a, uh, a uh, construction and operations plan in uh, the first one since Cape Wind uh, by the end of the year, and several over the course of the next uh, year or two. Uh, estimated 8.45 gigawatts of potential energy in the mid-Atlantic. Mid That's several million homes worth of energy. Uh, it's generated $68 million uh, for the U.S. Treasury. Um, and one of the re and, and, and the job creation both for construction and long-term development is very, very positive. One of the reasons we're very, very optimistic about wind energy in the East is the uh, reduced cost that we've realized as a result of activities over in Europe. Uh, our last two lease sales, New York, as you're probably familiar with, went for $42 million, which was uh, kind of hard to believe. We actually had our first auction that extended for, into a second day. Uh, and North Carolina came in at $9 million, which was considerably higher than anyone was anticipating, the Kitty Hawk sale. Uh, and we're also seeing, of these 13 leases, we've got eight or nine different corporate interests involved. So there's strong competition. Uh, we antici anticipate that it will grow. Uh, and even after, uh, even after we have that, with, with, with the uh, challenges we're facing, the current trends, including uh, turbine size, which continues to grow and has an effect on what the wind farms will look like, uh, the lower costs, like I mentioned, uh, following the European example, uh, the development of floating turbine technology, which would open up a whole new arena as far as the West Coast in particular is concerned, and the development on the state level of power purchase agreements, which guarantee the finance, which are needed to guarantee the financing needed to move forward with, uh, with farms. And these, these are all very, very positive trends. Uh, after we... Uh, if we develop these things, if we develop these farms uh, and, this, and, the, and the, on the leases that we have, uh, when we get to 2030, we could be looking at a dozen operating wind farms offshore. Uh, and there's, there's no telling exactly what, would, what is going to happen, but that's what we would project based on current trends and conditions. We're very optimistic about it. At that point, with those wind farms in place, you're still talking about a very small portion of the offshore potential for wind energy uh, and a very, very small portion of the market saturated. So 2030 and beyond, we think it's a, a, a very, very positive outlook. Uh, I mentioned first construction operation plan by the end of, end of uh, uh, this year and as, as many as 12 wind farms over the course of the next decade. We have challenges in that, uh, like anything else, there are, are, there are issues that we have to work through. Space use conflicts, fisheries issues, safety, uh, always the use of best available science, science, which is always just a little bit further away than where we are right now, and identifying appropriate monitoring uh, uh, techniques so that we can uh, have appropriate mitigation. So these are the challenges, but we think we're in very good shape. We're looking very much forward to the, to the growth of an industry here in the uh, uh, mid-Atlantic area. And I guess I'll, I, we won't put questions at the end. So okay. thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll move right along. We can get back on schedule. We might even have a time for a question or two before things. So uh, if Charlie, if you could come up, I think you're next up. Oh. Thank you. I want everybody to think about the question about this regulatory chokehold uh, thing. Uh, I'd be interested if you self-assess whether that's, that's a bit of an issue, but uh, I'd be interested in any response to that. Uh, 
get away with me. No. Definitely not. It came in this morning. Oh, that's mine. So um, Porter emailed it this morning, the updated one. Fourth one down. Yeah, that one. That one. So I'm back. Um, at the end of my uh, earlier presentation, I uh, indicated this uh, overlap um, that we're trying to manage between the measurement of the traditional ocean economy and contribution to gross domestic product and the environmental connections, uh, including the um, connections to ecosystem services. Uh, and I'm not going to pick up on that theme and extend it um, with uh, some work that Porter Hoagland at the Marine Policy Center at Woods Hole has been doing. Um, for our project for Marco. Um, let me just preface this by saying that uh, Mark and I spend a, a good deal of time traveling around the world uh, to talk about the blue economy. Um, and, and, and I have to say, I, I have to congratulate Tony. This is one of the few places in the United States the entire world is talking about the blue economy. The United States, it's nowhere. You can't use the term. It's completely obscure. I work for the Center for the Blue Economy, and I spend half my time explaining the term. In the United States, it's completely obscure. In the rest of the world, everybody gets it. So thank you, Tony, for at least introducing the concept to the US, rest of the US and at least the East Coast. Um, what's happening in the rest of the world is the, that, that the, the value of the economic value of the ocean has become a very hot topic. And nothing is a hotter topic than the question of ecosystem services. Uh, I was, I've been in China and India over the past year, and everybody wants to talk about ecosystem services, which is really great, except that we really have a terrible time measuring them, and even worse time in valuing them. So um, unfortunately, we've reached to the point where um, the, the greatest interest seems to be in the things that we as economists in particular are least uh, able to, um, uh, to talk about things. Um, I'm just going to skip over Porter's um, presentation here. Um, the, 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 the fundamental theoretical approach for ecosystem services is what's called the driving forces, pressures, state impacts and responses, which is basically this, this notion that there are changes in the ecological and physical nature of the oceans and coasts, which because of the way in which they interact with one another and with the living and physical process, other living physical and processes create pressures that change the state of the ocean and that changed state of the ocean then affects the way humans um, interact with the resources of the ocean and are affected by the ocean. And so what we're interested in doing in ecosystem services analysis is figuring out essentially how this, mo how this set of interactions between changes in physical, biological, and chemical processes, many of them driven by climate change, but, but, but many other factors as well, are affecting the way in which humans interact with, not just use, but interact with oceans and coasts. Um, obviously, uh, in this region, you have a number of these drivers that are changing CO2 emissions, um, causing rising sea levels, changing water temperatures, changing um, uh, the intensity of storms. Frequency of storms is still kind of up in the air as a, on the debate, but definitely also changing the chemistry of the water. 
Um, in addition, there are uh, increasing um, nitrogen releases, um, increasing changes in hypoxia and other um, characteristics of the ocean. Um, there are also human population changes, uh, some of which are more people um, approaching or moving or living on or working at the coast, some of which are more people living in the upland areas away from the coast but in the watersheds, and their effects, for example, building large amounts of impervious surface in the upper area reaches of the watersheds, creating uh, a, a change in um, the flooding potential um, in the downstream parts of the watersheds also affects the relationship in, between the uh, human population and the coasts and oceans. Um, <clears throat> the concept of valuing ecosystems um, has been, as I say, a hot topic now for many years. Um, internationally, um, the European Union um, and the United Nations have come up with uh, a typology of ecosystem services that more or less everybody talks about today. Uh, Mark had included some of this in his presentation. Um, and these are, include um, what are called provisioning services, goods that affect human directly. For example, habitat for commercial species. Uh, regulating services, the service provided by natural systems that help regulate environmental conditions, of which by far the, the most important probably in this context is the use of uh, wetlands, beaches, uh, what Jim was just talking about in terms of um, beach nourishment um, is a, an, a regulation of an ecosystem, the beach, which provides services in the form of flood, flood reductions. Support systems, these are the support systems that natural ecosystems provide, such as pollination, natural filters, and pest control. With, um, in, in ecosystem valuation work, the support systems, which are kind of the, what we would call the primary or the intermediate goods in the production of services, that's the area where we are least able to do much in the way of, of economic values. I mean, pollination is something that we can do, but a lot of this, particularly um, the, the value of water filtration, um, the old solution to the pollution is dilution effects, all of that stuff is much more difficult to value. Cultural services um, uh, primarily in this context are the day at the beach and then the the uh, recreational values, the cultural values of being at or near the water, which are um, substantial, well measured, and fairly well understood. Um, they've been intensively studied. Beaches have been intensively studied in the Mid Atlantic region for decades um, with respect to the, what are um, essentially, though the term was not used, uh, the cultural ser ecosystem services of the beach. Um, <clears throat> Uh, nothing is so frustrating to an economist as a salt marsh. <sighs> I know to those of you who study salt marshes, they are wonderful places. I, I'm fond of them myself. But as an economist, they are among the most complex environments to study because of their very different and complex set of relationships to human uses. They provide all of the bundle of provisioning, regulating, and cultural services um, and uh, economists have been um, very, it, it has been very difficult to, to um, measure these because many of them are not perceived. Um, the, va the regulating value of, of um, salt marshes, for example, um, has generally, it, it's not perceived. Well, the way we measure it is what's called avoided costs. Um, one study that uh, I was involved with the Nature Conservancy on um, uh, basically took Hurricane Sandy and they did the analysis of the New Jersey and New York um, coasts, uh, what was the actual damage, and then in the model they took out all the salt marshes. They basically made them disappear in the computer and changed the entire magnitude of damages because the salt marshes weren't there. But to do that was an enormously complex piece of work, and it reflects the, <coughs> the difficulties that we have measuring all of the parts of the ecosystem services. So generally, we're looking at um, one of the things we do is we ask people, how much would you willing to be willing to pay to preserve salt marsh? Most people don't know the answer, but 
when we get some reasonable answers, the, the very, in, in the mid-Atlantic, you get numbers from 80,000 to 159,000 acres, 80,000 to $159,000 per acre per year. That's, that's an order of magnitude of 100% off. So that, and that's the tightest we've ever gotten it. Um, so you can see why this frustrates us. Um, all of these things are, um, uh, that we have been talking about are uh, consumers of the ecosystem services of the mid-Atlantic ocean and coastal uh, ecosystems. Uh, some of them are well understood. Um, uh, tourism, uh, commercial fishing though, how commercial fishing for example relates to the underlying, we can, we can trace that back for example to some habitats, but ecosystems are more complex than just the amount of habitat for example that we set aside. Others such as waste disposal, um, uh, the example of the, the um, uh, New York bar garbage barges dumping off South Jersey, uh, we eventually came to understand something about that and stopped it, but there's still a lot of waste disposal that's going on there, and how much of that is degrading the natural capital and how much of it is um, uh, actually being productively used. Um, uh, we've already talked about the problems with commercial fisheries. Are the commercial fish, I mean this is, this is a classic example of the value of ecosystem services. Are the ecosystems degrading and therefore catch is falling? One could argue, for example, with lobsters that there is a change in the ecosystem, primarily the temperature of the water, and that's causing a big part of the drop in catch here in the mid-Atlantic. In Maine, the waters are warming south and west, and the catch is moving to the east where the waters are still cooler. But how much of it is due to the fact that we're not calling people on cell phones? Um, disentangling those things in terms of the, the, um, uh, the, the creation of the value is we're really only beginning to get at some of that. Um, uh, one of the big challenges, and, and I think Dennis's uh, conclusion here about volatility is spot on. Um, uh, one of the big challenges is on top of all the other volatility factors at work here, we have climate change. Um, and so we have, uh, we're, we're trying in our study uh, preliminarily to map uh, climate exposure on the horizontal axis here and biological sensitivity on the vertical axis and then s mapping different species to see at least where climate related effects whether they are positive, negative or probably both in different periods at different places and different times um, are going to happen. And we're just beginning to figure this out. This is a very preliminary thing that we're discussing in our study. Um, stay tuned for some more uh, information from that. Um, I mentioned the, the Hurricane Sandy study that uh, the Nature Conservancy did. Um, it's available on coastalresilience.org. Um, uh, and I'll move beyond that. Um, we've already talked a little bit about recreational fisheries. Um, so what are some uh, responses to these changes in ecosystem services? One is better measurement. Um, we need to continue to, to assess these things. Um, Porter notes we have to fix the flood insurance program, to which I agree, uh, to which I also have to say good luck. Um, uh, I'll come back to that. I can come back to that in greater detail. But clearly, li living shorelines and natural infrastructure, the, the biggest ecosystem services in coastal areas, in coastal ecosystems, are probably going to come from wetlands, both from the point of view of carbon sequestration and from the point of view of um, uh, regulating services and for flood protection. Um, and there are a couple of other. Uh, um, things that are that Porter mentions here uh, communicate all of the above to policymakers. So good luck with that. Um, ecosystem services are a hot topic. They are they are they, but they require a great deal of time, attention, and 
um, much more work um, to turn them into the same level of, of data and analysis that we can do with much of the other parts of the economy. Last but, but actually not least, greatest is travel and tourism, which really we have heard and I actually have said over and over again that um, travel and tourism is, is the largest sector, but it's actually been the one that I personally have the hardest to get a handle on. It seems to include a lot of little things, a lot of small businesses, big businesses, so really how you manage and, and work with that community uh, around um, uh, responses and trends in that industry has been challenging to me, so we look forward to our next presenter enlightening us. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, no problem. Thanks, Tony. Uh, so my name is Jeff Locker, and I work for a firm that's based out of Philadelphia called Tourism Economics, and we're a really simple firm. We're 20 econom economists, and we study tourism. Uh, we're also an offshoot of a larger firm called Oxford Economics that's based out of the University of England, and they're about 250 economists, and they provide a lot of global models for us that really lets us punch above our weight in terms of the amount of research we do and what exactly we study. Um, so really what you're going to be hearing from me today is a really optimistic view of what's going on currently and where it's going to keep going. Uh, to hit the highlights, uh, we're looking at, uh, in 2017, we're going to cross a trillion dollars in tourism spending in the United States. Uh, the, the five mid-Atlantic states, we're looking at states, not just the coast here, but in 2015, that was... Uh, $158 billion of visitor spending, $40 billion of income, and about 1.3 million of direct employment, direct jobs from tourism. And these are all going to grow quickly. Um, as Charles said earlier, we don't see employment growing quite as quickly, but in terms of spending, that should about double in the next 15 years, and income also about double in the next 15 years to almost $80 billion in total income provided by tourism. Uh, and it's also going to increase in share of the economy. Uh, currently, the, th that direct tourism employment accounts for about 6% of the economy. Uh, by 2030, that's going to move up and be about 7% of all the economy's employments. And when we look at this at, uh, state by state, just two things that caught my eye. One is that Maryland is the only state of these five in which the uh, overall economy is going to grow faster than tourism employment. Uh, the other thing was that in the mid-Atlantic region, tourism employment is going to grow faster than the nations, even though their economy as a whole is going to grow slower than the nations. So, you know, I really didn't know what to expect going into this analysis, but it's really bright and sunny for the mid-Atlantic region, really fast tourism growth, and especially look at uh, Delaware just explode um, over the next 15 years or so. I have my doubts. Uh, just some other, that was Oxford Economics data, and now we're going to move to the BEA for a different kind of data source, but it's, it's largely an agreement. Uh, you know, they have a diff slightly different timeline too, but about 5% uh, growth across the economy for all occupations, but then we see uh, lodging and accommodation sector growth you know, being much faster, uh, food service being faster, and then the only thing they didn't have especially fast growth in was recreation, where we have some mixed results there with some sector or some occupations growing slower and some occupations growing faster than the general economy. Uh, so what's driving this uh, massive growth? A uh, few items here. Uh, the first, an aging population. So America is getting older, and seniors and retired people have the most time to travel, so that's naturally going to lead to more travel. Uh, the other thing is the advancing medicine is going to allow seniors to be healthier longer, and so they're traveling later into their lives than they were traditionally. Uh, the second thing is increased connectivity and the ease of travel. So our technology makes travel easier to plan and um, less scary to, uh, to embark upon. So you know, one thing we're kind of monitoring and watching in the travel industry is the slow death of the timeshare industry. And the timeshare industry thrives because travel used to be very difficult to plan and very scary to go on, so people loved going to the same place every single summer. Now with uh, TripAdvisor and Expedia and all these websites you can go to and get rankings and ratings and uh, do last minute changes to your travel plans, it's, that's not the case anymore. So. You know, these same vacations every year are going away and you're getting people that are 
more adventurous and are not as are willing to travel more often because it's not scary. Uh, and then the next two I have kind of custom slides for. Um, so travel is a luxury good. And so for as long as it's been around, it's been increasing as a share of our spending. Uh, here's you know, just the last five years, you see lodging spending is up about 40%, while overall consumer spending is only up about 20%. Uh, other luxuries in the tourism realm, like food and beverage and recreation, are also growing faster than the general economy. Uh, on the converse, when we hit a recession, those are all going to drop much faster than consumer spending. But over the long run, these luxury goods are going to grow faster than the general economy and what consumers spend on necessities. So again, we're going to see fast tourism growth from uh, a greater share of our expenditures going to tourism. Uh, the other thing is international growth. So, you know, while the U.S. economy ticks around along at about two and a half, three percent a year, a lot of the international countries, especially the fast-growing countries in Asia, to a lesser extent Russia and Brazil, you know, they're going to provide a lot more economic growth and therefore a lot more international tourist. Uh, so, just kind of have a comparison here. We think that uh, U.S. domestic spending will grow about ninety percent. Uh, from 17 to 30, while world outbound or world international tourism is going to grow about 140%. So that's creating a lot of growth. Um, those Asian countries really powering at uh, over 200% growth. And then uh, just kind of a, an interesting, the, uh, the Western Europe full of mature markets that aren't growing as fast. So we're not seeing a lot of growth out of uh, mature markets, you know, Western Europe being a main one, uh, Canada being another really important one for the U.S. not providing quite as much growth. Uh, how will the tourism industry actually change? Uh, so the first one and the second one are really internet-based or largely internet-based. Um, people are getting, wanting more custom experiences and more authentic experiences. So there's a move away from the mass tourism, which is like picture New York City buses driving around all the highlights. People want a experience designed around their specific needs and their specific desires. And so that's where you go to Expedia or TripAdvisor to find you know, these, these little custom, uh, customizable items that you can add to your trip to make it really unique to you and special to you. It's also making them more authentic. So again, people are searching out. They don't want to go to the big restaurant on the side of the highway. They want to find the small Italian eatery that locals have been going to for 50 years. So, you know, more more money driving into the real local economy rather than kind of the mass-produced economy. Um, <clears throat> also, the internet's driving the gig economy. So, Uber and Airbnb are already getting billions of dollars uh, from tourists. Airbnb is, has a market capitalization roughly similar to either Hilton or Marriott, you know, which is amazing of a company founded less than 10 years ago. Um, there's still room to add more into this gig. The thing I'm looking for is to see someone that makes kind of a, uh, a tour guide Uber, um, where you, know, you can hire a concierge or you can hire a butler for your trip over a set amount of time or a tour guide. You know, those are available. It's, um, it's across different platforms. And one day, I think that'll centralize, and that'll be the next big uh, gig economy item in the tourism sector. Um, and as I already said, you know, more senior. Uh, that's going to be really nice for especially the coast because the seniors are what help you fill out your off-season peaks. Uh, they're more price sensitive, so they don't like going in the summer. Uh, they have more time. They don't have kids or their kids are grown, so they have more time in the off-season. Uh, and they might not be as into jumping in the ocean as younger people. So, you know, just walking the dog on the beach is probably all they need and you know they don't need the warm weather quite as much so the uh, the aging tourists are going to be a big uh, beneficiary for the region and then a couple slides uh, so as I mentioned uh, the international markets really going to be powering growth and in just the past 10 years or so uh, the share of all spending in the US done by international tourists has risen from 12 to 18 percent you know it's a bumpy rise but uh, God willing, you know, that nothing goes terribly wrong that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we, we expect that to continue to increase as these fast-growing growing economies keep sending more tourists our way. 
Um, and the other thing is there's going to be this increasing competition. So here's some, some work we did for uh, this TripAdvisor where we looked at how tourists rated uh, different businesses and what was the likelihood of those businesses closing in a set amount of time. And as you might expect, uh, the lower rated your business was, so on the left-hand side, those that are rated one or two stars are much more likely to close down than someone that's rated four or five stars. And this obviously isn't something new that uh, bad businesses tend to go out of business, but we think that uh, these websites and all these ratings and rankings is going to accelerate this process. So this is what we're hoping is going to drive the, uh, the traditional tourist trap out of business. So those places get identified and people don't go there as much in the future. Again, trending towards those kind of special, local, unique experiences that do create a higher economic impact for the region. Uh, what are the possible downsides? Um, first one, competition for real estate. So it's, it's a possible downside. Traditionally, tourism does really well in the face of rising prices. What happens is that we go from cottages and spaced out development to really centralized big hotel type development. Uh, that creates its own series of problems in terms of you know, what is needed road-wise and infrastructure-wise for the tourist. But, you know, you know, generally it's an issue of tourism forcing other industries out rather than rising prices created by other industries forcing tourism out. Um, we can move on to the political climate. Uh, so the president may cause a variety of, of problems for us on the international front in terms of tourism coming to the U.S. So this is something that was put out in uh, the winter by the Toronto Star, which is Canada's largest newspaper. And their basic opinion was Trump doesn't like us, Trump was voted in, so therefore America doesn't like us, so why should you go spend your money in America? Um, we fortunately haven't seen this actually come to fruition from Canada. Canadian visits is up this year, and we're hoping it stays that way, but I think there definitely is a potential downside. Um, just in time for my presentation, I think this happened two days ago, we got in a little spat with Turkey, and our two nations have canceled issuing new visas for one another. Um, so this goes beyond Turkey. So we started with the Muslim quote unquote travel ban, which affects a very, very small select part of the US travel market. Less than one tenth of 1% of overseas travelers come from those six Muslim majority countries. Now that we're moving towards Turkey, that's a pretty big deal. That's about half a billion dollars of international tourism spending a year. Um, we're hoping this kind of goes away and resolves itself in the next week. But this also creates a, a larger environment of people that have concern about their visa. And they don't like the idea that you know, one day the president can issue an order and their visa is no longer valid and they won't be allowed into the country. People want a relaxing experience both going on their trips and planning their trips. So if there's some concern that their visa's not going to be approved or that they're going to be hassled at the airport, even the fear of that, even if it's not actually happening, can drive uh, international tourist arrivals down. Uh, the next is destination marketing organization funding. I added Pennsylvania to this list just to get a bit a broader regional issue. But this is uh, these are the people that do uh, they're Visit New Jersey. Uh, they're the people that do the Virginia is for Lovers campaign. This is the groups that uh, put out, you know, we want you to come to our state and spend money in our state. And outside of New York, it's been largely flat in terms of uh, the past 10 years of funding growth for these types of organizations. While across the U.S., uh, spending on tourism promotion has increased 40%. Uh, in just this region, it's down 2%. Um, headlined by drastic cuts in Pennsylvania. And <clears throat> even where we are here, we're, you know, we're working with Visit New Jersey to hopefully boost their budget, but they've been on a freeze the past five years and it's down from where it was in 2010, I believe. Um, and this, I don't think, is gonna be a real concern, but I, I'd feel bad not at least mentioning uh, hurricanes and, and really severe storms. Um, Tourism tends to be really resilient, and it can bounce back from disasters or uh, terrorist attacks really quickly for the most part. Uh, 
I brought this up because uh, Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012, and so we'd expect some sort of impact in 2012 or 2013, and you know, you really just can't see it on that graph. Uh, if we really delve down to look at specific months and maybe specific counties, we would find that impact, but the overall message is on any sort of larger time frame and any sort of larger geographic scale, uh, we don't see a, a hurricane as being a huge scare factor going forward. And I think that'll take care of it for me. Thank you.